Good morning. Happy Fourth of July weekend. Uh, you'll probably be hearing a few more familiar uh, songs, hymns, uh, as we worship this morning, uh, as you just did as we enter into worship this morning. Um, so, uh, how many are going to fireworks? You gonna go see fireworks? Yeah, shoot off a few yourselves, maybe sprinklers or sparklers. Sprinklers, <laughs> sprinklers are counterproductive to sparklers. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm. It, it's good to be here together on this weekend, and um, we're starting a new series today. In fact, uh, it's called Drive. And uh, last week, I asked many of you, invited some of you, if you wanted, to write down on your connection card at the bottom an area in your life in which you wanted to grow. Now, if you could grow in some aspect of your life, what would it be? And in, if you weren't here last week and you have a thought that's, that comes to mind, an area of your life in which you'd like to grow, I'd invite you, write that on a piece of paper and when the, uh, rip it off on the bottom and when the, when the offering plate comes by, drop it in the plate. Um, this series is based uh, largely on the responses uh, that I got uh, last week. So thank you for those that filled that out. And again, if you didn't get a chance to, you're welcome to uh, today. But uh, here's why this is important. How many of you have ever felt stuck spiritually? Raise your hand. Yep. Not an uncommon place to be as a human being. It's not uncommon to feel stuck. So the question is, what do you do when you're stuck? And that's a bit about what we're going to be looking at today and, and starting off as we finish this series. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. And as we enter into worship this morning, would you join me in prayer? God, thanks so much for the day that you've given us. Thanks for um, what we're celebrating this week. Um, Lord, we pray that as we gather to worship, that you would inhabit the praises of your people and that we would sense your presence among us. Draw us close to yourself, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Do you stand? Let's worship. and loving God, we thank you that you have called us to this place this morning. You have equipped us with good and perfect gifts to love and serve you in this world. 
and we ask that you would breathe life into our gifts that they may not be guarded and protected but they would be released and shared with the community around us. Lord, for those of us today who are feeling stuck spiritually, we pray that you would draw us close to yourself to the extent that we experience afresh the new life you've given us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, my name is Bob Swickard. I'm the pastor here, and I want to welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, if you're new with us here today, we want to extend a very warm welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, in your bulletin, you'll find that Making Connection card. And again, on the back, if you want to, if there's an area of your life in which you'd like to grow, write it down there, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate. Um, if there are things that you'd like us to know about or prayers that you would like us to be praying for, you can also put those uh, on the Connection card and just put that, uh, again, in the offering plate when it comes by a little bit later. Uh, Taylor Fleming has an announcement about for our young people in the church. So Taylor. All right. Thank you for everyone who came to Moana. There were 116 people there. We had a fabulous time and learned a little about the courage that we can have when Christ lives in us. And a special thanks to all those who helped out and made it a success. And next Sunday is the big VBS kickoff as we start our five-night adventure from 6 to 8 p.m. The kickoff will be very fun, and there will be a dunk tank, inflatables, food, and games, so you won't want to miss it. Awesome. Thanks, Taylor. Um, I, I had posted on Facebook that there were like 105 people at the Moana movie night, and uh, but we had registration for people to come in, um, and they registered for a drawing, and when we counted, there was like 116, so uh, I underestimated, which is so rare in the church. But um, anyway, it was a great night. We had such a fun time. Uh, a few things just to be aware of. There's a lot of announcements in your bulletin, and uh, one of them, uh, just Tuesday, obviously the offices will be closed because the 4th of July, so um, you won't find anyone here. Uh, also, there's still time to register your kids for Vacation Bible School. You probably noticed when you walked in, we got a little bit of the uh, um, the uh, backgrounds are up and, and whatnot, so uh, it's going to be a great Vacation Bible School, and um, I think we have a video, in fact, uh, of an invitation. Take a look. Hey guys, what's up? So good, we could hear it twice. Our little budding star in the front row. Thank you so much for doing that. It really is going to be a great time, and there is still time to register your kids. So if you haven't had that chance yet, uh, you can take the opportunity to register them. Also, I want you to be aware of Financial Peace University. It's a class that we're going to be offering. Uh, if any of you have ever listened to the radio, Christian radio, and you've heard Dave Ramsey, um, Dave Ramsey talks about how to get a hold of finances to the point where your finances don't have a hold on you. It's an easy way to look at it. Sometimes Sometimes um, we know what it feels like to be upside down in, in that formula, right? When our finances have more of a hold of us than we do on them. And in, this isn't just for people uh, that have a, an abundance of debt. This is for anyone uh, who wants to uh, get a hold on uh, understanding what it means to be a steward of what God's given us and, uh, and how to, to do that in a better way uh, to, to benefit our families and, and everyone across the board. So that's going to start July. July 18th uh, at 6.30 p.m. If you would like to be a part of that, uh, right outside these doors, there's some sign-up sheets, and you can sign up for that class. Put your name down. That'll let us know how many to be um, preparing for. We already have two that I know of, uh, even if they're not on that list. So please stop by the list. Put your name down for that. Um, 
Also, uh, we're going to have a new member class on July 23rd. It's a Sunday afternoon, 2 o'clock. If you've been coming to Wesley and you for any amount of time and you'd like to make Wesley your church home, uh, I want to invite you to be a part of that. It's just an opportunity to share with you kind of who we are as uh, a church, uh, where we're headed, why we're headed that way. Uh, so if that's you, um, I think I have a sign-up sheet out on the Welcome Center. Uh, just let me know uh, if you're availability and we'll be happy to do that. Lastly, August 12th, um, how many of you remember the farmhands last year uh, in, in August, September? Uh, it's a, uh, it's a uh, bluegrass quartet. They were here. Uh, bluegrass gospel maybe is a, a better banner for them. I don't know. Uh, but they are going to be here again on August 12th. And uh, we're going to have uh, ice cream social and games for kids and such uh, on the 12th. It's a Saturday. The concert's going to start at 6 p.m. out and back. So I uh, want to give you enough heads up. You can put that on your calendar. It was a great time last year, and it'll be a great time again this year. Well, those are all the announcements that I have. So uh, Lynn Johnson and Ruth Ann Craig, thanks so much for helping us worship today. And we'll turn to you as you lead us now. pray. Gracious and loving God, we're so thankful um, even as we're listening to the music, we're reminded of so many memories 
not the least of which is that we enjoy a freedom in this land. And we know, God, that all across the planet today, not everyone has that privilege. That there are brothers and sisters in Christ in places all around this world where they must meet secretly because they don't have the freedom to worship. And God, today we're thankful for the freedom that we've been given in Christ and we're reminded that freedom is seldom free, that there's usually a cost. And God, we remember um, that it cost you your very life to give us the freedom that we now enjoy in you. We pray that we never take that for granted. And Lord, we celebrate our independence this weekend, and yet we recognize our dependence upon you. So Lord, we pray uh, for every person in this room today. God, you know our needs better than we do. You know our thoughts. You know our ignorance in the things that we ask for. And yet you've invited us, God, to cast all of our cares upon you because you care so deeply for us. And so I lift all these people to you today, Lord, and pray that you would minister to each life. Lord, we ask that you would continue to lead and guide us in our lives. We pray for those who are in need of your healing. We pray for those who have been in surgery over the past few weeks and are recovering. And we ask for a speedy and uneventful recovery uh, that it would be uh, complete. And for those that are getting ready to go into surgeries and procedures and tests in this week and in the weeks to come, God, we pray that you would uh, remind each one of your presence with them and guide them through the process. Lord, we pray for Wesley United Methodist Church and um, the ministry that you've given us. Help us to do it the, to the best of our ability. Help us to be a shining light uh, to Charleston and to places all around the world as you lead us. And through it all, we will continue to lean on you and trust in you for the outcome, even as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we sing the first two stanzas of our next hymn, we want to invite our young friends uh, who want, that'll go to Children's Church down the hall to follow Gina as we go to Children's Church. to bring before God the gifts that God's first entrusted to us. And uh, if you're new with us here today, please don't feel any sense of obligation. You don't have to do this. Uh, for those of us that call this our church home, it's how we invest in the ministry that's happening in and through Wesley. So may God bless you as we bring our tithes, gifts, and offerings to God.
Gracious and loving God, that is our prayer this morning, that you would bless this land. And God, we pray that you would not only bless this land, but you would bless countries all around this world today. God, as we bring these gifts, we've recognized that you have blessed us so richly. So God, would you use these gifts to bless others in the name of Christ? We pray it in his name. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading today comes from the chapter Acts 11, verses 19 through 26. It regards the church in Antioch. Antioch holds a very important position in the history of the Christian church. Um, do you know where Antioch is? And I don't mean the one up north by Wisconsin, where a bunch of my relatives live. <laughs> no, Antioch is actually still part of Turkey, but it was originally the provincial capital of Syria, one of many provinces of Rome. And it was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. So it's important that Peter, in his first pilgrimage to spread the word, would go north to the city of Antioch, which was a non-Hebrew community, a Gentile community. And so Peter became the very first bishop of Antioch, um, which actually, and I looked it up, <laughs> um, he was called an overseer. The Greek word, and remember please, the original language of the Christian church was Greek, was episkopos. And from episkopos we get the word bishop, but it means overseer. He was in charge of seeing that everything went on in Antioch the way they wanted it to go for the new Christians. And he was declared bishop, I believe it was in 47. Okay. It was from there he went in 53 onward to Rome to teach there. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, that's the Greeks, also proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Barnabas um, encouraged the church there to remain faithful to Christ and grow in their steadfast devotion. The psalmist uses an image of devotion. It says, like a deer pants for water, so my soul pants after you, God. I long for you. So I want to invite you, if you would, to uh, join with me as we sing. Maybe this is familiar to you. It's very easy to sing. It goes like this. As the deer pants for water, so my soul longs after you.
that is our prayer this morning. That we would draw near to you as you draw near to us. That as we turn to your word, you would write your word upon our hearts and weave your word into the fabric of our souls. That your written word would encourage us and empower us and take root in us. And we pray it all in Christ's strong name. Amen. Well, without direction in life, um, we will never discover the person that God created us to be. Fair enough? Without some sense of direction, we'll never discover the person that God created us to be. At least that's what we tell our kids when they go off to college, right? We want you to have a, a plan. We want you to have a, a purpose. Your 22-year-old your son comes home after he's graduated from college, and you say, well, son, what's your plan? And he says, I'm going to live in the basement and play Xbox for the next 10 years. And you say, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or something like that. No, you say, no, 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 no. Plot your course and set sail. Have a vision for your life. You know, plan your life. Live your plan. This is what we're to do. Make something of yourself, we, we tell our kids. But why do we say that? Because we're mean and uncaring? Of course not. It's because we want the best for our kids, right? We know deep down that a life lived in neutral won't take our kids anywhere. And that ultimately, when you watch someone that you love and care for, if their life is in neutral, they're not really going anywhere. You want the best for them, don't you? So you... Put it in low, put it in second, put it in drive. But there's so much more for you than just living life in neutral. Now, maybe that's not your kids. Maybe that's you today. Several of you raised your hands that you know what it's like to feel stuck spiritually. And it's true. We can all go through seasons in our life where we feel like spiritually we're stuck in neutral but when we're in neutral, we tend to settle for less. Our aspirations begin to wane. We experience less motivation. And ultimately, we just end up feeling stuck, dead in the water, not moving anywhere. But what if we could get out of neutral? What if we could get unstuck? What if we could begin to make motion in a direction? And that's my hope as we enter into this new series called Drive. Putting your life in drive. And again, these five areas that we're going to be looking at over the next five weeks came out of what you shared with me last week on the little tear-off things of areas in your life in which you would like to grow. Many of you said um, you would like to grow in your relationship to God. And so that's where um, today's message comes out of. Putting our life in drive begins with devotion to God. That's the D of drive. It begins with devotion to God. Now, if you want to move forward, if you want to experience more meaning in life, this is a great place to start. It's a fantastic place to start. To, to increase my devotion toward God. Of course, we probably should explore a little bit of what that means. Because we say we're devoted to many things, right? You've heard this. We say things like, I'm devoted to my wife. I'm devoted to my husband. I'm devoted to our kids. I'm devoted devoted to my family. I'm devoted to the sport that I've given my life toward. I'm devoted to my job. We, we understand the context of every one of those, right? You've heard this, yes? Nod your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so what are we saying when we throw out there, I want to grow in my devotion to God? Well, if you look it up in the Oxford Dictionary, you'll find that devotion means love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person or an activity. That makes sense. Love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person or an activity. When we're devoted to something, we make sacrifices, don't we? 
Now, I'm not devoted to running marathons, okay? Some of you are. Um, you know, we have some people that are devoted to Ironman uh, competitions. I, if I were to try to devote myself to 26.2 miles of running, um, I, I don't know that I could do that. I, maybe I could, who knows. But if I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna have to make sacrifices. In, I'm gonna have to say no to some things in order to say yes to running, right? And isn't that the bottom line of devotion? If you're devoted to your job, you are saying no to other things so that you can pursue your job. If you're devoted to your family, you are saying no to other things so that you can be, spend time with your family. If you're gonna be devoted to running, you're gonna say no to sitting on the couch, thinking about running, and running, right? You're gonna say no to other things in order to say yes to what you are devoted to. We make sacrifices for things we are devoted to. One of my favorite definitions from Adrian Rogers is this. Discipline says I need to. Duty says I ought to. Devotion says I want to. So let me just pause there for a moment and ask you, what are you devoted to in this life? What are the things that you say, I want to? Because when you start saying, I want to, and you fill in the blank, you'll start to discover some of the things to which you are devoted. You know, if, if I'm devoted to my job, I'm willing to sacrifice some time with the family in order to meet deadlines and get things done. If I'm devoted to a sport, I'm gonna say no to time with friends and family so that I can get better at the sport that I love. Now, just by observation, we can pretty much tell what we're devoted to. Um, according to an article that I read, 58 million Americans have a membership to a gym. 58 million, that's quite a few, right? Uh, gym membership health clubs, and these health clubs rake in $21.8 billion a year in revenue. Okay? That's a lot of money generated by the uh, fitness uh, realm. Uh, among gym users, 13.5% use personal trainers. So out of the 58 million Americans that are going to the gym or have gym memberships, 13.5% are using personal trainers. The average cost of a personal trainer is 65 bucks. Americans also spend upwards of $30 billion a year on athletic apparel so that we can look good when we go to the gym. Huge industry, would you say? Now, the question is, by observation, are Americans devoted to fitness? <laughs> I see a few heads nodding, no. Well, in fact, 67% of the 58 million people that have gym memberships don't go. <laughs> Almost seven out of 10. Almost seven out of 10 people have a gym membership, but they don't go. So would you say that they are devoted to fitness? Well, that's where we might <laughs> have a hard time proving that. You see, when we look at the things in life that we're devoted to, it reveals our priorities. And our priorities and our values are evidenced by the things to which we're devoted. Jesus put it this way, where your heart is, there also is your treasure. Where your heart is, there's your treasure. So in this passage today, Barnabas comes to Antioch. And he's seen what God has been doing in Antioch, and he's blown away. He encourages the church there to keep on keeping on. He's so thrilled about what he sees God doing that he wants to encourage the church. In fact, Barnabas literally means the son of encouragement. And so he encourages the church there to keep on keeping on, to remain faithful. And then, then he says this, I encourage you to remain faithful to Jesus with steadfast devotion. That word devotion in Greek literally means to put it out in front of you, to set it before you. This is the thing that has my attention. This is the thing that I always have before me that I want to keep in the forefront of my mind. 
So, in order to understand this, you have to understand a little bit about Antioch, which you've already heard uh, a lot about. Um, this, Antioch, so you see where Jerusalem is in the south, right? And, and when the, the diaspora it was called the dispersion, right? After Stephen, um, he, uh, Stephen is this Christ follower, and he's talking to the Pharisees, and all of a sudden he has this moment of clarity when he begins to speak the truth to the Pharisees, and he tells them, like, you're responsible for killing Jesus. Jesus, and the whole thing went south. They end up killing Stephen. And when they kill Stephen, the church disperses. It goes everywhere. They scatter because they're fearing for their lives. Many of them went as far north as Antioch, more than 300 miles away. Now, Antioch, you said fourth largest. Uh, my resources say third largest. Um, the only two cities that were larger than Antioch were Rome and Alexandria. Yep. There were about 500,000 to 800,000 uh, population of Antioch. This place was epic. I mean, the, it was laid out in a grid format, the city was. It had one main street that went down the center of Antioch, and it was paved in marble. There were marble columns on either side of the main street that stretched those four miles down the center of Antioch. Antioch was the only city in the known world at the time that had night lights. So that when the sun went down, the streets remained lit from fires that, will, that lined the street in Antioch. Now, it was also not known for its nightlife. <laughs> it was kind of a Las Vegas turkey style, right? In South Central Turkey, there's a, there, there was a place, and it was Antioch. And what happened in Antioch may have stayed in Antioch, it may have made its way elsewhere as well. Um, there was a, a satirist, a, a Roman satirist, Juvenal, once wrote of Antioch, the sewage of the Syrian Orontes, which is the river, uh, has for long been discharged into the Tiber. What he meant by that was that Antioch was so corrupt that it impacted Rome some 1,300 miles away. These people, man, there, were temp there was temple prostitution. Um, Daphne was the, the main uh, temple that they celebrated and they reenacted how Apollo came down and, you know, with Daphne and... Are we all in the same... I'm just trying to keep it PG here. Um, <laughs> And so worshipers would go to the temple where there was, you know, temple prostitution. They would reenact Apollo coming down. Yeah, I don't think they had problems with men going to church in those days, if you know what I'm saying. And that's the way it was known. It was known for that. It was known for debauchery. It was known for how fallen and immoral that it was. And it's in this immoral city that the church is exploding. And it's the first place where the Gentiles are being reached. And Barnabas says, stay steadfast in your relationship with Jesus. You know what? The only place that was more corrupt than Antioch was Corinth. And so Barnabas says, keep your eyes on Christ and keep your devotion to him fueled. Keep stoking that furnace. When we have devotion to Christ, there are some things that are going to happen. If we take our cue from this passage, we'll see, we see that it'll take the gospel into the world. When we have a devotion to Christ, you bring the good news of Christ with you wherever you go. Make sense? If you're devoted to Christ and you're giving your life to serving Christ, then wherever you go, you're bringing the gospel. You're bringing the good news of Christ. You're bringing the compassion and the mercy and the grace of Christ with you wherever you go. So the gospel goes with you when that devotion is fueled. Secondly, it points people to Christ when we're devoted to him, this is what the church was doing. They, in Antioch, they're going, you know what? Keep your eye, let me tell you what happened to me. I used to live following this way, but now I follow this one called Christ. And let me tell you how my life has changed. And so they began sharing that good news with people wherever they went, and they were pointing others to Christ. And miracle of miracles, these Gentiles are going to church, and they're learning more about Christ. 
and they're fueling their own devotion to Christ as the Christians were sharing their story. The last thing that it does when we devote our lives to Christ is it opens the door to a movement of God. That's what happened in Antioch, right? The church begins to explode there and the Spirit of God was moving in a vile city, but in a powerful way. It opened the door for the Spirit of God to move. Now, I don't know if some of you need to have a door opened in your life to the movement of the Spirit of God in it. But I do know that to put my life in drive, it begins by increasing my devotion, by, by setting before me my relationship to God. That's where meaning happens. That's where purpose is discovered, is in the presence of God. So, where does, well, how would that look in our lives if we were to grow our devotion to God? Let me just offer a few suggestions as starting points. First is this, watch for what God is doing. Develop eyes to see what God is doing. Many of you might be preparing to go somewhere to watch the eclipse, right? Uh, I, I saw some signs going down towards St. Louis, and, and there are signs up people are going to be celebrating the eclipse, you know? So when you look at that, what do you think of? You know, every night when I'm outside, if the, if the sky is clear, when I look up in the stars, I think of Psalm 8, where David goes, God... Your handiwork is amazing. When I consider the work of your hands, your stars, who is humanity that you're even mindful of them? Oh God, you know, and you, I, I, I go in my backyard and I look at flowers and I think those are the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I, I take a piece of oregano, we're growing oregano at, at my house, you know, I break that off and I smell it and I'm like, this is insane. You take lavender, I saw a, pl a lavender plant, and I broke that and smelled it. It's like amazing. And, I, and my brain just goes to, how creative are you, God? To create this world the way that you've created it. It's amazing. My eyes, everywhere I look, I see God. So we develop eyes to see what God is doing. Starbucks um, was recently stung by a consumer rating uh, because the, consu the people were saying, you know, whenever they go to Starbucks, the quality of the drink really wasn't that great. And the, they started doing surveys and they found um, that they complained that the fine art of coffee making uh, had been reduced to a mechanized process that had the romance of an assembly line. The, the, what, basically what was happening, hey, if anybody can appreciate the art of making a cup of coffee, I, I got that one. Uh, but what people were saying was that Starbucks was rushing it so much that the quality of the drinks weren't that good. And so the upper echelon of Starbucks said, all right, all you baristas, uh, you're going to start steaming only the amount of milk that you need for one drink, the drink that you're making. Don't steam a big old pitcher and then just, you know, go down the line and pour them all out one at a time. And what was interesting about this, um, you know, apparently, you know, the, um, the upper echelon was inviting Starbucks uh, baristas to learn how to slow down and smell the coffee. But um, what happened as a result of this, you would think that the consumers would go, way to go, Starbucks. But what they found is that it took longer. <laughs> and people started going, wait, I want my drink and I want it now, you know. So it kind of backfired in a sense. But maybe it's time that you and I start slowing down enough to focus on the relationship that we have with God, lest we miss what God is doing in our midst. You know, it's kind of like the Ferris Bueller uh, quote, you know, life moves pretty fast. <laughs> if you don't slow down every now and then, you miss it. Secondly, make time to grow in the Lord. Make time to grow in the Lord. You know, we call this devotions, right? Morning devotions. Some of you do this. Some of you get an, an email from the church on your phone or in your email and you pull it up and it's a devotional. It's a way to start your day. It's a way to fix your thoughts on the presence of God in that moment. So when you do devotions, what you're doing is you're saying, God, in the next five minutes, in the next two minutes, in the next 20 minutes, in the next hour, I just want you 
to set the course of my day. I want to turn my thoughts on you and focus my life on you before I get lost in the, in the, in the drill. What does that mean? Well, it means to meditate. Some of you said you want to grow in meditation. We can talk more about that later. Um, but reading scripture and praying and just being silent before God. One of the most profound exercises for me um, was when somebody told me that I didn't have to say anything when I prayed. That all I needed to do was just be aware of God's presence. And be aware that God wanted, it, it, it's as if, um, think of it this way, that in the moments you're, you're, you're taking out your heart and you're holding it before God and you're simply saying, God, I don't know what you want to do with my heart, but I give you permission to do it. And then just be aware that God is right there. And God is working on your heart in whatever way needs to happen. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. You just offer God your heart. If I could invite you to spend about five minutes, ten minutes this week sometime, take a time and try that. See what happens. Just say, God, I give you my heart. And whatever you want to do, I give you permission. Make time to grow in the Lord. You'll always grow from spending time with the Lord. Uh, I love the story about there was a businessman who got on an airplane, you know, and he sat down and this young man sat next to him. They buckled in and they're getting ready to take off. And the businessman was trying to make small talk with the young man next to him. And he says, so business or pleasure? And the young guy says, well, pleasure, actually. He said, I'm on my honeymoon. And the businessman said, really? He says, where's your wife? And the, the young guy goes, oh, she's back a few rows. And the businessman said, oh, well, I'll happily give up my chair, you know, so that your wife can come up, you know, so you can talk with her and he said oh no I've been talking to her all week I'm good you know sometimes I, I wonder if we don't say things like that you know I went to church on Sunday I'm good I, I'll go I'll, I'll be good for a week you know and next Sunday I'll come back and I'll talk again you know and, and see what happens I, I'm good we're good we talk you know can you if you're married can you talk too much no joking can you talk too much? Can you get to know someone too much? Can you tell someone that you love them too much? Make time to grow in the Lord. And then lastly, keep following and sharing Jesus. This is Barnabas's plea. Stay faithful to the Lord and, and just keep on keep it on. Remain in that steadfast devotion. Share Christ with people that you go, wherever you go. I think a lot of times people get, they get kind of weirded out when you're talking about sharing Christ. I hear things like, oh, well, you know, we shouldn't impose our culture on someone else, right? Have you heard this? This is a sermon in and of itself, by the way, which I promise I won't go into. But let me just push back a little on that, that sentiment. We shouldn't impose our culture on someone else's. So what you're really saying is that the Christian culture is uniquely American and it doesn't belong to anyone else. Is that what you're saying? Of course not. Read Revelation, where John talks about all the nations coming to God, and all the nations are bringing what's unique to them to the, into the presence of Christ. It's such a beautiful uh, a depiction of all the nations coming under the Lordship of Christ. So when we don't share Christ, what we're saying is, it's okay, we don't care if you go through life without hope. We, 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 don't, we don't care that you, you know, go through life without any sense of vitality or joy. No, Barnabas says, share it. It's life-giving. And you don't have to know, you don't have to know about Antioch. All you have to know is, and, and I've used this a ton, all I know is for me, this has been my experience. I'm not imposing that on anybody. I'm just saying, here's what I've experienced in the time that I've walked with the Lord. And sometimes that's some of the most um, empowering language that we can use. Just own it, but share it. Can you imagine what this world, can you imagine what this church would look like if all of us had before us, what set before us is our relationship to God? And the devotion that you and I have 
continue to grow day by day. Can you imagine the impact that we would have on Charleston if our devotion to Christ was growing at such a level that all we saw was a way to bless people in the name of Christ? That's how the world gets transformed. Barnabas saw it. He saw the beginnings of it in Antioch. And we're continuing to live it out today. Let's pray. Gracious God, it's such an amazing image in my mind to think of what it looks like when an entire community continues to grow in devotion to you. Lord, we know that the things that we're devoted to will set our priorities. What we're devoted to will determine what we say yes to and what we say no to. So Lord, would you pour out your grace? We don't have to do this on our own strength. We can't. But we do invite your spirit, Lord, to do a work on our hearts that our devotion may continue to grow in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's, um, it's not an accident that we come to this table of grace once a month uh, because it's here at this table of grace that we remember uh, just who we are and to whom we belong and what Christ has done on our behalf. And so we remember that it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed when he invited his friends to an upper room. And he said to them, I've longed to share this meal with you. And he gave thanks for the bread, which he had done hundreds of times. But this time, when he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So take and eat all of you, and as often as you eat of it, remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, and he had given thanks for the cup hundreds of times. But this time, after he gave thanks for it, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. So take and drink, all of you, and as often as you drink it, remember me. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of the bread and participate in the cup, what we're doing is... In a beautiful way, we're participating in the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Christ. And we're inviting him into our lives. So Lord, would you pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ for the world. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until that great and glorious day when we feast at your heavenly banquet. Amen. I want to invite those that are going to help serve to come forward and as they're doing that um, to receive the elements, um, I'll explain just a little bit about how we celebrate communion here at Wesley. Um, we understand this not to be a Methodist table. Uh, we understand it to be the Lord's table. And as such, all are welcome who seek to be in a relationship with God through Christ. You may not even know what that next step looks like, but if you're ready to take the next step, then you're, please know that you are more than welcome to participate uh, in this sacrament. Um, we take by intention, so when you come forward, take a piece of the bread and then dip a little corner into the cup, uh, in essence, taking both elements at the same time. And after you've received the elements, if you'd like to spend some time uh, at the altar rail, you're welcome to do that to pray or to go back to your uh, seat on the other side of how you came down. Uh, usually, if we come down the aisle side closest to the center and go back uh, on the other side, that tends to work fairly well. We have a gluten free station on your far right and um, that's a dedicated cup and gluten free bread so if you prefer that that you're welcome to do that um, and then if you can't come forward for any because of physical limitations just make eye contact with an usher or one of us and we'll be happy to bring uh, the elements to you but this is God's gift offered to you freely it cost him his life uh, because of his love for you so come as you're led
Gracious God, we're so thankful for this mystery in which you reveal yourself to us. And God, even though we may not fully understand what happens through this sacrament, we invite your spirit to nourish our souls. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Empower us to live for you through example. Give us grace and mercy and compassion, not just to keep to ourselves and enjoy, but to pass on to those around us, that others would see Christ in us. We ask it all in his powerful name. Amen. Now as we close, um, this is a, a different tune for the hymn. So if you like the words, you can use the screens. But of hymn 629, let's close by singing, I don't know, a few verses of it. Let's see what happens. You know, God does satisfy the hungry heart. And as you go from this place today, you're going to walk out these doors and into your mission field, a place where every day this week you'll have an opportunity to share the love and grace and compassion of Christ. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God's Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Have a great week.